200. And we have some beautiful weather here. We had cloudy skies earlier in the day, but now the sun is shining and we're set for 80 laps of great competition on the Daytona High Banks. Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Jenkins, and welcome to Daytona International Speedway as we continue our coverage of Speed Weeks 93. You know, ARCA began as a upper Midwest short track sanctioning organization back in 1953, but it's not that way anymore. As a matter of fact, this race here today is without question the biggest race that G-Drivers will compete in during the entire course of the year. And who better to talk about the ARCA sanctioning body itself than a former champion of the division? Here's Benny Parsons with Ned Jarrett. Bob, there's no doubt that the two ARCA championships I won was the reason I was able to get that NASCAR Winston Cup ride in 1970. I was able to move south and become part of the Winston Cup Tour only because I had success in ARCA. And then I think the same thing holds true today. It is a great proving ground, no question about it. Good place to get experience running on a super speedway against veterans. Of course, we have a lot of rookies in the field, too, which sometimes makes it exciting. But it is a good avenue for drivers to learn, get experience at a relatively low cost. And and of course, this series has grown tremendously over the years. I remember not too many years ago when they had trouble getting a full field of cars. There were 60 drivers trying to get in this 40-car field today. For more on it, let's go to the pits and Dr. Jerry Punch. You're right, Ned. This is the 40th anniversary for the Toledo, Ohio based Automobile Racing Club of America. And you said 60 cars were here? That's right. 60 different cars representing 17 states and Canada came here trying to qualify for 42 starting spots. It's been an entry level series, but at least one driver chose this series to exit this racetrack today. And that is the veteran 60 year old Red Farmer from Hewington, Alabama. Red over 700 career wins. Says today will be his last super speedway start. But he leaves a legacy behind. Young drivers he's helped, including last year's Daytona 500 winner, Davey Allison. But there's another driver in today's field he's helped as well. For more on that, here's John Kernan. Jerry, remember last year, Loy Allen Jr., his first trip ever to the Daytona International Speedway, stole the spotlight by winning the pole for the ARCA 200. He called that his freshman year at Drafting University. This year, he plans to study under one of the masters, as you mentioned, Professor Red Farmer. Look for those two guys to hook up today and chase down the man that they have been calling the Rocket this week in the ARCA garage, Jeff Purvis. He outqualified Allen by two miles an hour. Now, he hopes to use this series in a good run today to graduate, move to graduate school, if you will. He has a Winston Cup car here, also a Bush Grand National car, so we can look for a lot of things to come in the future for Jeff Purvis. And the excitement begins to build as a great crowd is on hand here at Daytona, set to watch the beginning of stock car racing on ESPN for 1993, the ARCA 200. Starting lineup for you. On the pole, qualifying at 187.6 miles an hour, Jeff Purvis from Clarksville, Tennessee, in the Phoenix Construction Chevy. Outside, Loy Allen Jr. in the Hooters Ford. Going to road number two. On the inside, it's Bob Shack from Lombard, Illinois, flanked by Tim Fidawa from Holt, Michigan. Row number three has Peter Gibbons, a Canadian, alongside Gary Bradbury from Chelsea, Alabama. Row number four, veteran Red Farmer from Hueytown, Alabama, and Coopersville, Michigan's Tim Steele. Row number five, it's Mike Wallace from St. Louis, Missouri, and from Lebanon, Pennsylvania, Bobby Gerhardt. The sixth row, Concord, North Carolina's Kerry Teague and Bob Brevac from Ashland, Wisconsin. The seventh row, Nashville, Tennessee's Jeremy Mayfield and Bob Keselowski, former champion of this division. In the eighth row, it's Jimmy Horton from Hamilton, New Jersey and Bobby Bauscher, the defending ARCA champion. Ninth row, Mark Thompson from Georgia and Tim Sauter from Nacita, Wisconsin. The tenth row, Frank Kimmel, the uh, rookie of the year last year from Jeffersonville, Indiana and Ken Allen from Shelby, North Carolina. And as you look at the remainder of the starting lineup, the car is down the back stretch, and in a half a lap, we'll get set to go and uh, have 80 laps of competition. I'm all excited for this. It's great to be at Speed Weeks, be in Florida in February. It's where we ought to be if you're interested in racing. <laughs> this is the place to be. <laughs> this is definitely the place to be. We have drivers from 16 states and one province in Canada represented here this afternoon. 16 Chevys are in the field, nine Fords, 10 Oldsmobiles, three Pontiacs, two Buicks, and two Chryslers, as you see the entire starting lineup for this event. There's the uh, in-car camera that will be carried by Jim Sauter. Pedigree Dog Foods in-car camera. Good sponsor on that car. And Jim Sauter also has a Winston Cup car. He'll be doing double duty, the ARCA race and the 
Winston Cup race, the Daytona 500 by STP next Sunday. Car pace car pulls off the racetrack, and here we go. Here comes the pole sitter, Jeff Purvis, leading him down. The green flag waves, and we are underway with the ARCA 200. With the restrictor plates, Bob, it takes them a while to get up their speed. When they start off of turn two, we might expect to see some of them start fanning out, maybe even see some three abreast racing down the backstretch. Meanwhile, the front row is just exactly like they lined up at 30 miles an hour. Beginning to build up the momentum, but you're right, Benny. The first two cars are right where they were when the green flag dropped. They stay side by side as they head for the 31 degrees of banking between turns number three and four. It is Jeff Purvis on the inside, and there's the in-car camera carried by Jim Sauter, and you can see how close the cars are as they come off the fourth corner and complete lap number one with Purvis about four or five inches ahead of Loy Allen. And I tell you what, you can see just how these cars wiggle around at 190 miles an hour, and yes, folks, they're running 190 miles an hour as they go through the corner side by side, just inches apart. There's a bit of a breeze blowing here this afternoon from the first turn down the backstretch. They will have a tailwind as they go down the backstretch, and they will be coming right into the wind as they come through the trioval. Still no movement up front. They are still side by side. Looks like these cars are dead even. You'll see one of them get just a little bit out in front, and then he runs into that wall of air up there that has been opened up. Then the other one might go out a little bit, so they just can't either of them get an advantage on the other. But the big spoiler that they're running on these cars this year is allowing them to run that way and, and the car be pretty stable. We have only had one minor spin during the entire speed weeks here as far as stock car racing is concerned. That was in ARCA qualified. So indeed, the cars are very stable this year with that enlarged spoiler. Still up front, it is Jeff Purvis on the inside. He was the pole sitter, Loy Allen Jr. on the outside. John Kernan has a comment on Loy Allen Jr. Bob, this morning at the driver's meeting, talking with Loy, he was a little bit concerned. He thought Jeff Purvis may rock it out in front of everybody and take off. But the one thing that may work in his favor, he's starting on that outside line, so he's having Trouble to get green. Big crash in turn number three. One car loose, and it's going to take out many, many cars. When you have something happen up front, and they're still coming in there, when one car up front gets in trouble, then everybody else barreling in there at full speed, they simply can't slow the cars down quick enough to avoid it. I believe it was the 55 car of Tim Speedwell that, yeah. that lost control. And man, I'm telling you what, how many cars was in that crash, Ned? I don't know, about two-thirds of the field, it, it looks, looks like. that way. Yes, yeah, because Tim Fiedel was started fourth. Yeah, and he was running there or fifth or so when, when the incident occurred, so everybody behind him had virtually nowhere to go. A couple of cars coming down pit road as the yellow flag is waving. But there you can see some of the carnage. One car is on fire. Peter, Gibbons. Peter Gibbons. Yep. Yes, it is, the Canadian. Extinguishing the fire that broke out in the front of that car. Well, let's take a look at it. Here we see, uh-oh, it looks oh, like Shaq yeah. just barely touched Tim Fiedel. And now Shaq goes up, makes contact with cars on the outside. That was Bob Shaq in the blue car, the Prano Auto Parts car. It looks like he just barely made contact with Fido's car and the racetrack, there's nothing, no place for the guys to go. And it doesn't take much at the speeds they're running, just as you say, a slight tap and spent. That's Gary Bradbury, Bradbury I think, around. on the outside. Is that 78? Yes, Gary Brad in the red, red car. Jimmy Horton comes in in 32. There's a hood or something flying through the air like a kite. <laughs> A lot of good race cars torn up. There goes Bobby Bowser, the champion, then on the inside. Here's a, and here's the chain reaction that happened behind the original spin. I have nowhere to go. I looked at the racetrack is completely yeah. blocked. There's nowhere for anyone to go. At 30 miles an hour, you couldn't drive through there. Well, There's there Bob Shack's car. Yep. The blue car. I believe that could be Horton behind him in the 32, maybe. Uh, some heavy damage to Horton's car. There's, There's Red, Red Farmer. Farmer. He was in it. He got clipped. He came on down, came around, came down pit road. Uh, John Kernan is uh, down in the pit area with the crew chief. With with Doug Taylor, the crew chief for Tim Fidoa. And Doug, one of those unfortunate incidents, leaving you guys very disappointed. Tim has radioed in and told you he's okay, but can he get the car back around? No, I don't believe so, John. The, the car's pretty bad. You know, it's just a shame in, in this race. It's a longer race, and uh, 
you know, the car was running really good today. It, it's, uh, it's just really a shame. This crew's really worked hard. Mark Dew built us a heck of a motor. We felt like we had a good shot at winning it, you know, and Timmy was sure doing a good job. And uh, uh, one of the guys got up into him down there, and it turned us around. And, well, as you can see, what the damage has done to about half the field. So it's just a shame. Well, they'll try and pack it up. They'll survey the damage somewhat, then pack it up. But they will be back here next week to run in the Goodies 300. Fetal are running the entire schedule this year on the Bush Grand National Circuit. So the race has been red flagged. The cars have stopped here in the tri-oval as they uh, clean up the damage. Jerry Punch is with Bobby Gerhardt. And Bobby climbs out of the car. First of all, Bobby, your Chevrolet heavily damaged behind us. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I really didn't hit anything that hard. It just... Uh... Awful well, scary there for a minute. They started spinning, hitting one another. You just couldn't see anything. Did you see what happened in front of you? You were about uh, ninth or tenth on that lap. It, it looked like Bobby Shack and Fido got together. I'm not sure who did what, but just cars went everywhere, and there's just nowhere to go. A tough break for Bobby Gerhardt. His Chevrolet behind us heavily damaged. He is out of it here in the ARCA 200. And for several other drivers, we do have just about half the field that was involved in this crash. We count about 20 cars that had made it back to the tri-oval here and we'll take the green flag when the race resumes. Here it is once again. Bob Schacht is a blue car. He goes up, touches a red car. That's Tim Fiedewitz. They both lose control, and now the racetrack suddenly becomes totally, completely blocked. These cars running, what, net 100 miles an hour? Well, more than that, I would say, Benny, as they, as they come in there, and uh, as you say, nowhere to go, and the brakes simply won't stop those cars that quick. They were too close on them. There's Bob Keselowski. He was a former champion in ARCA. Finished second in points last year. He sits in his car waiting for the restart, but it is heavily damaged, and I think there's some question as to whether he will be able to restart. Well, we're off to a rather uh, bad start here as the red flag is out because of a multi-car crash in turn three. International Speedway for you on ESPN Speed World. A lot of repairs going on down in the garage area behind the wall as we've had a multi-car crash on the third lap of this event in turn number three. Here's how it happened. Once again, the blue car, Bob Shack goes up, makes contact with Tim Fedewa. That's the red car, and the racetrack just gets blocking it. Everybody coming in there at full speed had nowhere to go. They locked the brakes down, tried to slow them down, but again, it's hard to do at those speeds, so they just many, many cars involved. This Here's is from Jim Sauter's in-car camera. And you can see everything is fine. He's going in the third corner. We can see the smoke up at the top out of his windshield. And all of a sudden, Ooh. cars start going sideways. That's Mike Wallace and Doron Pontiac. Boom. Ooh, and he makes contact and goes down, and it looks like he might have hit Mike Wallace. And there you can see the work that's going on in the Jim Sauter's car. That's trying Mike Wallace's get, car. Yeah, and trying to get it back into the race. Well, these are the cars that were involved in the incident and right now are either officially out of the race or behind the wall and will not be taking the green flag here in just a moment. So about half the field eliminated or uh, seriously damaged in that crash. No report, however, of driver injuries at this point. Bob, you see this flag blowing? You mentioned earlier that there's a tailwind going into turn three. They're going into that turn at least 10 miles an hour faster than they they would if that wind was not blowing that strong. You wonder if that might have had anything to do with uh, causing that wreck. Jerry Punch has a comment on Mike Wallace. Guys, they have been working on the cars you saw moments ago down here behind the wall, Larry Penn, and some of the crew chief, some of the crew rather for Rusty Wallace's car, Winston Cup car are here working as well, but the news just came a moment ago. Too much severe damage to the chassis beneath the rear of this Pontiac. Mike Wallace is out of it today. What a tough break for a young man who qualified in the top 10 and looked to have a good option and possibly a win today. Getting set for the green flag, Bob. 22 cars take the green flag and resume racing, so we lost 20 in the crash, and the green flag comes out of the completion of lap number seven as we begin lap number eight. And that is still Loy Allen Jr., the leader of the event, with Jeff Purvis right behind, and now Bobby Bowser up to third. Bobby Bowser started 16th, and he went through the grass to miss that crash. So he was able to get through unscathed and looking pretty good right now. this race last year, who was in the crash, so he won't win it again this year. Here's a challenge for the lead. There goes Jeff Purvis. On the inside of Loyal, takes that spot away. Bowser's going to try to follow him through. And he makes it through. Bowser takes second position as Loyal and Junior drops all the way back to fourth position.
Coming into third place is the number 95 car. That is Jeremy Mayfield. And John Kernan has a report. Well, Bobby, you see how Bobby Bowser has moved up. I went down and talked to Gary, Bowser's crew chief. He says that the spotter says he has no idea how he made it through all that mess, but it had to have been superior driving ability with your eyes closed. <laughs> and this car that he's got out there right now is the same car that he finished second in this race the last two years. That's just about all you can do, and then close your eyes and hope that you get through it. <laughs> what else can you do? Mayfield now challenging Bobby Bowser for that second position as Loy Allen hangs by there in third. Meanwhile, Jeff Purvis has stretched out the lead. He has, and somewhat surprising, although he did qualify a couple miles an hour faster than did Allen, but he's pulling away just without the help of any draft. The pole speed here this year was 4.4 miles an hour slower than last year, mainly because of the larger spoiler that the cars are required to use this year. That Jeremy Mayfield in 95, you know, Ned, it's amazing how those guys from Nashville stick together. <laughs> he's from up around Nashville, Tennessee. I was down in this city, but he was here testing that car, and Bobby Hamilton came with him to try to get the car uh, the chassis set on the car because this is Mayfield's first race in Daytona. And Darrell Walker has helped Bobby Hamilton, so it just goes on goes back, on. all those guys from that area. Those guys from Nashville really stick together. There's a car on the inside. That looks like Ron Burchett. And he's coming to the pits. Meanwhile, it is still a good battle for second and third position. Boucher, Mayfield, and Loy Allen, Jr. John Kernan talked about that one car being a rocket ship. He's shown to be so far. First Frank Kimmel and Kirk Schumerdine. That name should be familiar to your racing fans. He was the crew chief on Dale Earnhardt's car last year. Retired from uh, mechanic work last year and is a race driver this year. Had a little trouble getting into the field, but he did. And now Shelmerdine takes the position away from Kimmel. Right up on the outside and went around. Looked like a Dale Earnhardt type of a move. He did. Well, he certainly has worked with one of the best drivers in the world, that's for sure. That's a race for fifth. Now, Shermadine is fifth, and Kimmel is sixth. Kimmel, of course, the rookie of the year last year in ARCA competition. And there up front are the leaders. There is Purvis, who has really stretched it out. The car stalled up in, I don't know if he's hit the wall or just up in turn four. Car indeed against the wall in turn four. We do not see a caution at the moment. They're hopeful that the car can come down off the banking and get to pit road without creating any problems. And he did. It's the 89 car. Of Jeff, Jeff McClure. McClure. There he is. And he's made some heavy contact oh, yeah. with the outside retaining wall. And still no caution flag, but he's... we can see the right side of that car is just flat. And he is uh, well within pit road now, so no problem. There it is. Oh, he made some pretty significant contact. Now he, he got through the wreck. He was one of those drivers that started far back in the field. In fact, he started 35th, has had uh, some engine problems. He had been getting his engine from the Bob Whitcomb team, NASCAR Winston Cup team. Of course, they folded up now. And here's car number 39 being worked on. But anyway, Jeff McClure. Had a break in getting through the field, but maybe he might have cut a tire or something running over the debris and didn't realize it and had the tire go flat and got him into the wall. That is Sauter that's getting to work there in the pit area. That was the in-car camera shot you saw just a moment ago as you watched the crew working on the car. Out he goes again. 12 laps completed here with Jeff Purvis well out in front of Bobby Bowser, Jeremy Mayfield, and Loy Allen Jr. in the ARCA 200. Tony in the ARCA 200, Jeff Purvis is the leader, followed by Mayfield, Allen, Bowser. There you see the second 10 as uh, Joe Nemorowski has moved up into 10th position. Airship Shamu from nearby SeaWorld over in Orlando providing the overhead shots for us today. One of the many attractions here in the Daytona and Orlando area. Let's go to John Kernan in the pit area with uh, Jeff McClure. Jeff, some heavy contact up there in the wall. You're okay, but uh, what happened? Uh, evidently, there's still a little bit of debris on the track, or either I picked up something, you know, from that big wreck, and it just blowed the right front tire, and, you know, ain't much you can do. Now, I thought for a minute there the, the luck was going to be on your side. You were starting 35th. You moved all the way up to 7th. You missed that big wreck. How'd you do that? 
I don't know, man. To be honest, we just got lucky down there. There was so much smoke and all I couldn't see. But, uh, you know, we was doing the buddy deal with Andy Hillenberg in front of us. I looked at his tires, and he was looking at mine. And, you know, we thought we was all right, but evidently not. Let me show you real quick what a blown tire looks like when you cut it down. Look at this. It even cut the inner liner. And he's lucky he wasn't injured in that incident. There is Bobby Bauschu, who is running in fourth position and miraculously made it through that big pileup. And this is how he did it. And you would think we talked, we kidded about closing his eyes, but you see, there's no way he can do what he did with his eyes shut. He has to be driving the car. You see, the racetrack is completely blocked. And here he comes. That's white car. He goes driving by now next to the grass on the apron like he's going to the grocery store and drove <laughs> right through it. You got to drive through there pretty fast because those cars are headed right down for you. And exactly. By golly, they missed him and he missed them. <laughs> So Bowser getting ready to restart with the others. And we will be back for the green flag and a resumption of this ARCA 200 from Daytona right after this. Stay with us. Next time around, they'll be getting the green flag. Let's go quickly to Jerry Punch. Well, the leader is Jeff Purvis. And why would you see a Winston Cup car owner sitting here in the ARCA pits? And uh, Larry McClure, what are you doing here? Well, you know, that old car has uh, visited Victor Lane here before a couple years ago. and. Uh, we thought Jeff could take it back again. Uh, the whole crew, the, the Phoenix construction crew, and James Finch uh, worked really hard. Gary Blue's done an excellent job preparing the car this week, and we thought it ought to have another chance. And you know, Jeff's got all the talent and tools to uh, to be successful in this sport. So we thought we'd let him have a good day. That's Larry McClure, the car owner for Ernie Irvin. This car that Jeff Purvis is driving won the 1991 Daytona 500 with Ernie Irvin aboard, and maybe a few two in a row. Green flag is out, and I'll tell you what, in the early going of this race, it has proven its superiority. It is a fast race car. Look how quickly he jumps out into the lead as we have a change of second position. Loy Allen Jr. has passed Jeremy Mayfield. Bowser's back in four spot now. Well, McClure was pulling away before the yellow came out, but to get that far, just on a less than a half a lap, he is fast. Larry McClure talking about the race car. What are the Bill engines? Maybe Larry McClure has loaned them one of his Winston Cup engines to go in that car. It looks like it. <laughs> it does look like it, doesn't it? They're second and third. Loy Allen Jr. and Jeremy Mayfield. Jeremy Mayfield's been pretty impressive so far. Yeah, they've sort of separated themselves from fourth place Bobby Bowser. Coming down will complete lap number 19. Jeff Purvis well out in front of the field. And uh, Jerry, what, what do you know about this engine in the uh, Purvis car? Well, answering Benny's question, guys, it's exactly what Benny said. When they bought the car, they bought the entire package. It is a runt Pittman engine in the car, so it's the entire car and engine that won the Daytona 500. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> that answers that question. Hey, guys behind, just give up. <laughs> Look at Purvis trying to break the draft, going really low on the backstretch. Of course, he had to pass that car, but still got down almost to the grass. Look at Kirk Shermandeen trying to go by Bobby Bowser on the outside. Boy, Kirk's doing all right, he isn't he? He's doing okay. That's a battle for fourth place. Kirk Shelmerdine up high, and Bobby Bowser down low. Shelmerdine has got the position. Good move. He just takes that thing high and moves right on around. And it looks like fellow Floyd Allen might be picking up a little bit on Jeff Purvis. He might have picked that draft up and might be gaining a little bit on it. He's certainly John, not losing. John Kernan has comment on Kirk Shelmerdine. Bob, I was talking to him this morning. I said, hey, how is it now that you're a big-time race car driver? He said, well, it'd be a lot more fun if I was running really fast. Well, now you bet he's having fun. He's up front. He says that he's only got plans right now for this race on ARCA, but it depends how well he does. If they can get a sponsor, get some more money, they might run some more races. And one other note, the guys over at Richard Childress' shop says that Kirk still comes by. They're still on very friendly terms, and those guys are watching him and maybe give him a little, little advice. In fact, they said Earnhardt may be hooked up on a radio. He may have a few words of advice for Kirk during today's race. Look coming here. He is called Jeremy Mayfield. I'm telling you. Started 37th. Wow. Now running fourth. You know, I would have bet money that Kirk would have been back with a crew this year, a Winston Cup crew, by the time the season began. When he retired last year, I thought, well, he'll uh, take a couple of months off, and by race time, when it rolls around, he'll be ready to go back as a crew chief somewhere. But by golly, <laughs> he's, uh, he's a race driver. How about it, John? 
I think that's what he wants to do right now. You know, talking with him today, he said he didn't have any plans at all to go to another team and be a crew chief. And some of the guys on uh, Childress's crew told me that they think that, yeah, it was uh, what he said when he turned in his notice that he was just kind of burned out of being a crew chief. Now let's go down pit road to Dr. Jerry Punch. You know, on Thursday's first day of qualifying, Kirk Shelburne had engine trouble in the car. Couldn't get the car over 160 miles an hour. And that wouldn't even make the field unless run up front. There were a lot of teams in the Winston Cup garage hoping that Kirk would get possibly discouraged and say, I'll give it up and come back and be a crew chief. But not Kirk. He put another engine in the car, came out, he made the field, and now he's got to feel pretty glad he did because he's probably having a pretty good time up front. Boy, I'm sure he is. He's looking very, very strong. They're still working on Jim Sauter's pedigree car, still trying to trim that sheet metal back so that it will not rub against any of the tires and get Jim back out there. He's a former uh, winner of this race. He did win the race. And you wonder, folks, if you're wondering why they keep doing this, why they're working on the car, this is for the sponsor. They're trying to get some TV time, exactly what they're doing. See that big pedigree sign? They're doing their job. Jerry, you down there? We are right here beside Jim Sauter, the 78 winner of the Arca 200, and he's driving for the Rulo Brothers, a team he finished second in his car with at Michigan last June. And exactly right, Benny Parsons. So few teams in ARCA competition have giant sponsors. This is an opportunity for Pedigree to get involved, a dog food company in ARCA racing, which really puts on a heck of a show. Well, I'm sure they're uh, wishing that that car would be uh, running rather than healing right there, or sitting, <laughs> <laughs> shall we say. And patiently, Jim Sauter waits for the crew to get finished so he can go back out there on the racetrack. A fellow out on the racetrack, Jeff Purvis has begun to pull away now from Loy Allen, and the second and third yep. place cars are beginning to catch Allen. Still exactly. Mayfield and Kirk Schermerdine are, are gaining there. Here comes some cars back in the back. That's Ken Allen, the black and red car. I can tell that car instantly. David Simcoe in number 51. But the uh, three car, Kenny Allen, was in that crash. As the car on the, our left side was in that crash as well. We can see the damage on the left side of it. That's Ron Rose. Bob Brewer is in 10, and Bob Keselowski is the black and white car on the outside. And there's a beautiful shot from the airship Shamu. Hovering overhead of Daytona International Speedway on Arca Day, 1993. Here comes Kirk. He took over that third spot. I realize we're looking for Shamu, but just to keep you abreast. Pretty good battle for position there as Allen heads up the racetrack trying to take away the position from David Simcoe. And he does it. He's on the outside, takes a spot away. Here's our field summary showing you where the cars were running last time they crossed the stripe. That does not, of course, reflect Kirk Shelmerdy now being in third position because that happened just seconds ago. Several of these cars were involved in the crash and have spent some time in the uh, in the pit area or behind the wall getting fixed. And there you can see some of the cars that were eliminated in the big accident in the third turn on lap number three. Jeff Purvis still leading the race. That was the 15 car of Craig, Craig Rube, right? Yes. There's Purvis. Finished construction, Chevrolet Lumina. Boy, you can see what kind of lead he has on oh. the second place car of Loy Allen. Wow. And look at this third place car right on the back of Loy Allen. Our hero, Kirk Schumberdine. <laughs> Kirk Schumberdine in third position as we've completed 26 laps out of 80 in this ARCA 200. We'll be right back with our same day coverage of this event right after this. Kirk Shelmerdine running in fourth at this point is Jeremy Mayfield and in fifth position is the O2 car of Frank Kimmel. And the best thing these fellows can do is exactly what they are doing and that's hook up in a draft and I think Kirk Shelmerdine realizes that if he pulls out and try to pass Roy Allen he's only going to slow both of them down and there's nothing to gain by doing that. Just sit there and and uh, draft together and try to stay as close as they can to purpose. 
We might point out that Shelmerdine, we've talked about how he has been a uh, chief mechanic for the last few years, but he's no stranger to racing. He won the NASCAR Sportsman Race at Charlotte back in 1991 and finished second in Sportsman Points last year. So he has some super speedway experience. And I think that's one reason that he decided to try his hand at driving because he did have some success, success in that sportsman car and he's not getting any younger. He must be in his early 30s and he said, look, I've either got to do it now or never do it. So, yeah, he's 34 years old. His 34th uh, birth, 35th birthday coming up uh, March the 8th. I'm impressed with the job that Kirk is doing. Yeah, me too. They went a fourth place car. There's Frank Kimmel and Bobby Bowser racing for that fifth spot. Bowser now currently has it, and Frank Kimmel trying to take it away. The 0-2 car, the black car, is Kimmel. Saw his dad, Bill Kimmel, down in the garage area this morning. I used to race with Bill and Iggy Katona, our Grand Marshal for yep. the Arca 200 today. And I'm sure you drove with uh, Bobby Bowser's father, too. Jack Bowser, Jack, that's yep. true. A lot of second-generation drivers here this weekend. There is Jeff Purvis now beginning to weave his way through some of the slower traffic, passing the number 39 car. That's uh, Jim Sauter. So Sauter hasn't been able to repair his car. He's back on the racetrack. Really running pass. pretty good yeah. with all the damage he has to the car. That's Rick Shepard in that 77. That's a Chrysler, I believe. And Purvis goes by him on the outside, and uh, now he tries to look on the inside of Sauter. That was fairly easy. Passed him right here at the start-finish line. And pedigree in-car camera showing Jeff just motoring away. Riding off into the sunset. <laughs> now he pulls back up on the outside of a car. You can tell the car's handling it because he passed on the outside, inside, and back on the outside. Looks like he can take it anywhere he wants to on the racetrack. He was running before he caught this group of traffic that he went through, and it only took him about a lap and a half to get through them. But he was running at about 48 seconds flat, and around the racetrack, the second and third place cars drafting together were running about 48 and a half seconds, so he was gaining about a half a second to lap on. That's about what he qualified, was it? About 48 flat? I would guess that that's about what he qualified. So Somewhere he... in that area. And there, you can see the second place car running across that same traffic the battle for second place that remains the best battle on the racetrack as Lloyd Allen Jr. and Kirk Shelmerdine are nose to tail separated by about uh, a car length or two here's the serial on Kirk Shelmerdine started in 37th position by lap five he was up to 10th fifth at the end of 15th laps fourth at the end of 20 laps and <laughs> at the uh, end of the 52nd circuit he was up to third now, folks, he didn't cheat and pass all those cars. There was a huge crash. If you just turned on your TV, there was a huge crash on the third lap. That's how he got by a lot of those cars, 20 of them, as a matter of fact. There's the interval between first and second and third. Purvis just dominating here. Last lap average speed, 188.3. Two, three miles that's, per hour. That's faster that's, than they qualified. Yeah, he qualified 187.645, getting the benefit of some draft out there. Well, we see the hood on that uh, Jim Sauter car kind of flapping in the breeze as he pulls up behind one of the... It's Jody Morosky in 87. Now, see when he pulled up behind that car and got in the draft, mm -hmm. how the thing quit, the hood quit uh, waving around? Now, as he gets back and the wind starts hitting, see how he goes up and down and starts flapping? If he can get behind cars, see how calm? That's what we're talking about, about calm, smooth air when you're drafting. For riding with, example. Riding with Jim Sauter, who first drove in ARCA at Daytona here in 1976 in a Dave Marcus Dodge. Finished 22nd in that outing. He ran second to Woody Fisher in 1977, then won here in 78 after a thrilling last lap duel with Bruce Hill. And look at Shelmerdine. He's taken second. He's gone. The outside of Loyal took that second spot away. Oh, boy. Hey, Ned, maybe he is a race car driver. I'll tell you, he's showing some good signs here. No I, mean, I, thought, I thought he'd bought a helmet and put on a uniform and called himself a race car driver, but he just might be a race car driver. He's proven himself. <laughs> that is great, Kirk. He's doing a heck of a job. And it's pulled away once he moved around. Now he's going to run that Earnhardt groove down next to the white line. 
I'm sure he's learned a few things from Mr. <laughs> Earnhardt during the few years that they were together. <laughs> you know, you really can't see that much. You can't see that much when you're a crew in the pit area, but uh, I'm sure he goes, has went home and watched tapes and then talked to Earnhardt about why he did this, why he did that, in trying to set up the race car. So, yes, he's had many, many conversations with Dale Earnhardt. And if you missed it, earlier today here at Daytona, Dale Earnhardt was the winner of the Bush Clash. So Earnhardt is back, it looks yes. like, in the Goodrich Chevrolet. He started dead last and in 10 laps won the race. Yes, he was he was 13th on the, on the original 10-lap field and uh, went to the front. Jack Bowser's in the pits. Don't know if it's the schedule. is not too far away from schedule pit stops. But he is in for change of right side tires. I said Jack Bowser. That's Bobby. <laughs> Jack's his dad. We knew I'll get over that sometimes. <laughs> <maybe. laughs> if he races long enough and I live long enough, maybe I'll call him the right name. Maybe when uh, Dale Jarrett starts making pit stops, we'll say there's Ned in the pit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pit stop comes on lap number 36. Took a little over 20 seconds for Bobby to get uh, service on that car. He's rolling again. I'll tell you what, with 35 laps, I would imagine we're going to be starting to see some pit stops yeah. then. With the restrictor place, they can normally go uh, somewhere between 40 and 50, but he might have decided to come in a little bit early. And I don't know how much effect these taller and bigger spoilers will have on the gas mileage that we've seen in the past. Uh-huh. You're right, they might use a little more fuel because of that extra drag of the rear spoiler. All right, John Kernan is standing by with Mike Connor. Well, Mike is the crew chief for Kirk Shelverdine, and Kirk's doing pretty well. He's uh, second place just past Loy Allen, but uh, is that a little bit of strategy in trying to chase down that one car? Well, he come on the radio a while ago and said to call and see if we get in touch with Loy Allen and see if he'd let him in front because they wasn't catching the one car the way it was, and he thought maybe they could run better if he is in front, but I don't. it don't look like it's heavy in that way either. How much of, it, of his driving style is he like? Has he watched tapes of how Earnhardt and he knows how Earnhardt's driving? And is he trying to use some of the same things, you know, kind of a classroom going to school on Earnhardt style? Hey, he probably talks to him a lot and learns a lot. He, he's probably as good as down here as he is. What about pit stops? We're lap 37. Should be coming up in that window right now. What are you guys going to do? Somewhere around 40 something. We're going to try to, you know, 41 or two laps and then go the rest of the way if we can. That's Mike Connor, who is working as a crew chief for Kirk Shelburne, your second place car right now. And John, one reason that it didn't help much when Kirk got in front of Loy Allen, he broke the draft. He drove on away from him, and they, they were not drafting together like Kirk was doing when he was running behind Loy Allen, so they didn't get the advantage of a two-car draft. He now is driven away from him. Quite a separation now between second and third position. Well, we talked about the spoilers and how they have been. The size has increased, and the angle is different from as it was last year. Here's Benny Parsons with more in this Track Fact. Track Facts are brought to you by Quaker State. The big Q is one tough motor oil. Jeff McClure and I are going to show you the difference in last year's spoiler for the ARCA 200 and this year's spoiler for the ARCA 200. First, Jeff, throw last year's spoiler up on this Chevrolet Lumina. You can see the thing four inches high, around 57 inches across. That's all around 230 square inches. Last year, they ran them at 40 degrees. The angle was 40 degrees. Watch this year's baby. This thing is six and a half inches high, 57 or so inches across. What's that, 370 square inches or so? And they got to run it this year at 50 degrees. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, this makes the car more stable. Bigger spoiler, the more angle, it's, the car is more stable. Another thing, they want to keep these cars around 190 miles per hour so they don't fly through the air like kites. And now you know the difference between the spoiler used last year and the one used this year. Jeff Purvis, the leader of this race, has just seen the cross flags, indicating that we are halfway through this race. 40 laps completed, 40 to go at Daytona. Purvis continues to lead the ARCA 200. Some of the uh, cars have made pit stops, but most have not, and we anticipate pit stops now from Purvis and Shelmerdine, the second-place car, before too long. Well, he's gone past the halfway point, so he knows that he can go 100 miles on a tank of fuel, so any time now he can come in, have enough fuel to go the rest of the way. Some guys were talking that if he 
if they had a 12 gallon gas can there that they might be able to make it all the way that they feel like they can run 130 miles or so but and if they had about a 12 gallon gas can they'd be able to go put one can in but unfortunately the rules dictate they can only use an 11 get gallon gas can jerry what do you uh, know about this well, actually, Benny, what they talked about is most of these teams do they could maybe go as many as 60 laps on just what they have in the car. But as you saw a minute ago, that big spoiler Benny Parsons showed you may have been the equalizer, so they're not going to take a chance. They are getting ready to call Jeff Purvis in the pit road. They figure, why gamble? We've gone halfway. We'll put some fuel in the car and go back out. But that's really the unknown here. The spoiler is different this year. The, the plate on the engine is exactly the same. 29, 30 seconds. It's a little bit bigger than the Winston Cup cars use. Fourth place, Jeremy Mayfield is in the pits as we watch Jeff Purvis slow down, drop off the banking, and enter pit road. Here is Jeremy Mayfield, the Shoney's End machine, getting service at the far end of the pit area down toward turn number one. Purvis has made his way onto the pit area, and here he comes. Jerry Punch is right there. As Jeremy Mayfield pulls away in front of Jeff Purvis, he brings the Chevrolet, the Phoenix construction Chevrolet, very deliberately down pit road, being careful to tap the brake. And now Gary Ballou, along with some help from the Morgan McClure, Ernie Irvin, with the cut crew, will fuel the car. There is no tire change. Repeat, they will not change tires. The Goodyear radio not wearing at all here in the first 45 laps of this race. They want to get the car completely full of fuel. And now the signal, the car is full, and Purvis will pull away in 17.2 seconds. I tell you what, Ned, they could not make it on 12 gallons again can because no. he put about 16, 17 gallons of fuel in that car. He, he put a good portion of that second can in there. He sure did. Well, we understand that both, Kirk, yep, coming on to pit road now, both Kirk Shelmerdine and Loy Allen Jr. So second and third positions coming in at the same time. And 70 Shemardine, miles an hour speed limit. Exactly. And the show, John Kern is down in Shelmerdine's pit. Just like Purvis, this is going to be a gas-only stop for Kirk Shelberdine. He says the tires are feeling great. They say they can run all day on these Goodyear Eagle radials. First can of gas goes in. Second one now. Shelberdine sitting patiently, waiting, waiting. And Jerry is down pit road with Loy Allen. And they will change right side tires on the Hooters Ford of Loy Allen, the fellow who won the season finale in Atlanta. They figured they could change two right side tires in the time it would take to fuel the car. They have fueled the car, and they have trouble now with the right rear. They are trying to get the right rear lug nuts on. Shelburne also having a problem further up pit road, John Kernan. Jerry, they're having problems in getting the second can of gas for the valve to push in and deliver the fuel into the gas tank. Finally, they finally get the overflow and uh, to show that the tank is full. And Kirk finally pulls away, but losing a lot of time. And Loy Allen also has made his way off pit road. Down to Jerry. Further complications for Loy Allen. They finally got the right rear tire on the Shelburne. Just gets by Loy Allen at the finish of pit road. But Loy Allen car stalled when it came off the jack. That cost him another five or six seconds. The only good thing about all of that, fellas, is both of them had problems go back out together. They'll be able to hook up in a draft, but yep. that was some, some uh, very long pit stops. Yeah, ironic that both should have trouble, different kinds of trouble on their uh, pit stops. Frank Kimmel uh, is the leader, I would imagine, at this point, since those ahead of him have pitted. He probably hasn't pitted yet, so he's out there leading the race, and... and uh, Yes, he is. There is Frank Kimmel. He picked up a sponsor this morning, but I can't remember who it was. Indiana Steel is his longtime sponsor. They're on the hood of the car, but he had another name on the quarter panel. And uh, now he might have made a pit stop during that second caution and took on some fuel, which would let him run a little longer here. He's staying out there. I'll tell you one thing. He certainly doesn't want to run out of gas. <laughs> Not with those big spoilers on because uh, someone, uh, I think I heard Mike Bean, crew chief for Bill Elliott, say the other day that, that if you shut it off at the start-finish line, you almost don't get it back. It won't coast back to the garage area because of that big spoiler it just dragged and it And that was a Winston Cup car, and this has even more rear spoiler than a Winston Cup car. Mm -hmm. Not too far behind Kimmel, however, the white car that you see right there yes. blasting into the picture is Jeff Purvis. So Kimmel's going to lose the lead here without making the pit stop. Jerry, why is uh, Kimmel not electing to come in right now? 
Bob, let me answer one question first. He did not pit during the first caution for that major crash in turn three. He is being shown as a leader, but the crews have told him possibly that there is some rain in the area. He said, I said a couple of raindrops on my windshield as Jeff Purvis now goes by. Frank Kimball to take the lead. And now the crew says, we don't need to gamble now. Even if the rain comes, we've got to have fuel in the next three or four laps. So Purvis takes the lead back from Kimball, and you are right. The skies are definitely darkening, especially in the northwest. And uh, the, the weather usually comes from that direction here at Daytona. So we may be in for a shower here before long. We are past the halfway point. Hopefully we can get this entire event in before the rain comes. Look at that Purvis good. Man, he's flying. Maybe Ernie Irvin should have kept that car. <laughs> I'll tell you what. It's a good race car. And he's doing a good job of driving. But you'll see that he'll pick up the draft of every car he can. See, he pull right in behind this blue car as he comes over, but he doesn't get too close until he goes. He doesn't want to take any chances. He just moves on by on the outside. That was the car number 10 of Glenn Brewer. Meanwhile, the battle has resumed between Kirk Shelmerdine and Loy Allen Jr. It isn't for second place anymore. They're in eighth and ninth. However, they are hooked up once again. And Kirk looked like it slowed down just a tick before that caught that uh, pit stop that he made because Loy Allen had gained on him. Mm -hmm. And Loy Allen has changed tires. He has fresh tires on the right side. And so that should be an advantage. It normally is an advantage. And is that Jeremy Mayfield right in front of them? No. Nope, that's the 38 Andy car Hillenburg. Andy Hillenburg, the old sprint car driver from Indiana. Same guy who has fast track, right? Yes. Okay. Not to be confused with the sprint car driver, Andy Hillenberg, who lives in Oklahoma. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, knew, I thought there was two Andy Hillenbergs around. There are, yep. Okay. And both were sprint car drivers. Both were sprint car drivers, mm -hmm. yep. The 0-2 of Frank Kimmel finally makes a pit stop. He had the lead, then was passed by Jeff Purvis. Now he comes in, keeping under the 70-mile-an-hour speed limit down pit road. He stops on the marks, and the crew goes to work. See the Jackman almost tripped and fell down as he went across. Car's a little slow going up on the right side. Checking the left side tires. They appear to be okay. You get new rubber only on the right side. And about almost 23 second pit stop for Kimmel. That car went down a little bit quick on the right side because that lug nuts. I hope they got the lug nuts. Got to stay under that yellow line. Under the yellow line. The yep. Good point, Bob. That's the uh, blend line. Leader Jeff Purvis has been just about all race long, and the average speed of the race is 133.721. The track record 153.2. But of course. We had to slow down because of the big crash that occurred on lap number three, eliminated about 20 cars, but resulted in no driver injuries. More from Daytona International Speedway in the ARCA 200 in a moment. As ESPN resumes its stock car coverage for 1993, bringing you same-day coverage of the ARCA 200 from Daytona International Speedway. Of course, we had the Rolex 24 that was held here last week on the air last night, along with our Bush Pole qualifying show. And we have a couple of other events uh, coming up here at Daytona. Two Speed Weeks coming up next weekend, one live call-in show, and we'll also have the Goodies 300 for you next Sunday evening. Well, Jeff Purvis has just left the sixth place man. He's on the same straightaway with the second, third, fourth, and fifth place men. He's, he has about a 35, 30 second lead. Whoa! He made a good pit stop, running awfully fast too. So you put that combination together and you move away. That's right. He only put fuel in the car where some of the cars did change tires. Lloyd Allen changed tires, and Kirk Shomardine had all kinds of trouble putting gas in his car. So, you know who the crew chief is on this car, don't you? Loy Allen's car? I mean, uh, no, uh, Purvis? Purvis, uh-huh. Gary Ballou. Really? Yep. I heard someone mention Gary Ballou a moment ago, and I didn't realize that. Yep. Great driver in his own right. He sure was. 
Jeff has uh, seven starts in ARCA competition and has led in all seven. Now, here is the battle for third position as several of the cars made pit stops and uh, therefore fell back in the serial. Second place belongs to Jeremy Mayfield. Here's third and fourth, Kirk Shelmerdine and Loy Allen Jr. And these guys have had themselves a race all day long. They have run right together, and they're coming up on the car number 95, who is currently running in second place, Jeremy Mayfield. They are only about 15 car lengths. There he is, the white car right in front of him. They are gaining as they hook up in the draft. So that's going to be the race for second place uh, as soon as they get there. Well, John Kernan is down in Kirk Shelmerdine's pit, and John, uh, you got a further explanation on the trouble that he experienced during that pit stop? Yes, yes, Bob, I do. This is a standard catch can. You see this piece of metal that sticks out? You put this in the overflow at the rear of the trunk. This opens a valve, which when the fuel goes into the tank, it allows the air to escape, thus allowing the fuel to go in, replacing the air. What happened was, with their catch can, they didn't have one of the, uh, the piece of metal to open up that escape valve. So they had an airlock. The fuel just could not go in, so Kirk is going to have to pit again because Mike Conner says they did not get enough fuel into the car. Now let's go down to Loy Allen's pit with Dr. Jerry Punch. John, a minute ago we saw Loy Allen's crew have trouble with the right rear tire. Then the car seemed to stall. But that's not really what happened at all, Mark Hooter. What happened to the car? Well, on the pit stop, the clutch wouldn't release on the Hooters forward. The right rear tire was spinning. We had to kill the engine in order to change the right side tire. So it's pretty hard to change a tire, guys, when the clutch doesn't release and the right rear tire is going maybe about 80 or 90 miles an hour. Pretty hard to find those lug nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, many, so. so many guys have went to a hydraulic clutch in these race cars, and they're, yet, they're, yet they're having trouble. Sometimes that hydraulic just will not release. Mark Martin was telling me that twice last year he had a clutch problem, and they're going back to the old mechanical-type clutch where there is not a problem, that you push the clutch in, mm -hmm. and mechanically it releases. It disengages, yes. Yeah. Yes, and not hydraulically, so I would imagine that's exactly what happened. He had a hydraulic clutch in the car. Well, Kirk Shelmerdine is in second position, and Loy Allen Jr. is in third, but as you heard John Kernan say, Kirk is going to have to have another pit stop because they didn't get enough fuel in the car. But right now, it's a pretty good battle between those two drivers. And we talk about experience, drivers. You know, they're getting experience on big racetracks and what have you. Well, we see that pit crews need experience, too. We've watched the pit crews today and say, look, these guys take 18 seconds to change two tires. And Kirk Shemmerdine, they couldn't get any gas in the car. These are the what you have to do, what, what you have to learn to be able to make pit stops like Earnhardt's crew and Darrell Walters' crew and, and Kyle Petty's crew, all the rest of them on the list of them. Another field summary for you showing five cars on the lead lap at the 56 lap mark. 24 to go, right? I don't know what to say. 56 laps completed out of 80. That's good. 20 perfect. Yeah. And there goes the leader, Jeff Purvis, by the fifth place car. So he's trying, to, there he's are, trying to go by. Yeah. No way, he hasn't passed him yet. Yeah. We've got a race, Bob. Well, watch this. What do you want to bet he passes him? Well, I don't down know. Down the back stretch. <laughs> See, look at it. He's not passing him. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, uh, not yet. Uh, okay, he passed him. <laughs> that's, that's the car number 18 of Robert Ham from Auburn, Alabama, the Budweiser Charlotte. And Purvis is like he is on a rail, Jerry, looking real good. Bob, this could be the beginning of a very big week for the young youngster from Clarksville, Tennessee. We mentioned before they bought this car from Larry McClure, Morgan McClure Racing, Ernie Irvin. Well, actually, they bought three race cars from that same team. Purvis plans on running this race today. Next Saturday's Goody 300, which you'll be able to see on ESPN. And, of course, the Daytona 500. So it could be the first of, of three events, possibly three wins, for a young man from Tennessee. Boy, that's... Uh doing a lot of work during stock car speed weeks isn't it it is doing a lot of work but it's getting a lot of experience yep. and right now jeff purvis around 30 years old that's what he needs is experience lap after lap on these racetracks race for second there's kirk shilmerdine in front the white car the white and orange car the hooters forward that's Lloyd allen out of raleigh north carolina he won the last race of the year at Atlanta in 1992, so he carries some momentum over into 1993. As a matter of fact, Loy Allen this year is going to run three Winston Cup events. So uh, not only ARCA, he's going to run some events, Bush Brown National Park, but also three Winston Cup events with some help from uh, Nationally Fresh, one of the companies owned by Hooters. 
Yeah, Bob mentioned he carried over the momentum. He also carried sponsorship over, too, because that That's win right. in Atlanta, I think, yeah. helped to solidify that sponsorship. Fifth place car of uh, Robert, Robert Ham. Ham is in the pits. We saw him get lapped just a moment ago. Now he's coming to the pits. Cleaning the windshield. Look at the tires. One can of fuel has gone in. That should be all right. Yeah, the car is full of fuel. He drives back out. As Ned Jarrett mentioned a moment ago, 70 miles an hour is the speed limit on pit road. Out on the racetrack, Jeff Purvis has just completed lap number 60, so we have 20 more to go in the ARCA 200. A race that got off to a rather bad start with the big crash, but we've had uh, no major incidents since then. Je uh, Jeff McClure was the reason for this only uh, other caution of the day. That's when he had some contact with the third and fourth turn wall, but that was uh, a minor incident, at least in terms of uh, damage to the car. So he, oh, spin up in turn two. Uh, just as I say, it's been pretty clean. We have a spin in turn number two. And I was also about to mention that Kirk Shelmerdane needs a caution. If he's going to have to stop again, not many cars in the lead lap, he's going to get it. John Stratman is the driver in trouble up in turn number two. The car went up the banking and may have hit the wall, but he didn't hit it very hard, I don't believe. He no. just came out of the pits about two or three laps ago. And we can see a little bit of damage to the rear of the car. It looked like he went up and, and hit the wall ever so gently, not up very hard. But it does bring out our third caution of the afternoon. Now, this will, of course, allow Kirk Shelmerdine to come in and get that fuel that he needs. So uh, it, it's a good break for Kirk Shelmerdine. And another break. There's not a lot of cars left running. We've crashed about 20, 22, three cars. So when he restarts the race, he will not have that many cars to pass to get back to the front. Well, with only four of them in the lead lap, so he'll be mm -hmm. able to pull right yep. up there. Yep. Rescue vehicles going to John Stratman's car, which is now in the grass at the bottom of turn two as Jeff Purvis has slowed down on the back stretch and allows the rest of the field to catch up with him. Pace car has the field in tow, and the wrecker has arrived at Stratman's car. I'd like to see those rescue walkers, workers walk up and just casually start talking to the driver. Yeah. Looks like, is that the driver walking around? Yes. No, sorry. Thought the yeah, there he is. He's outside. Has his helmet on. There you go. So John's okay. Car's damaged. He's out of the race. The nurse said, "Come on, let's give you a ride to the hospital." He said, "Let me see how bad the damage is first. <laughs> Will I know out of a heart whether to have a heart attack or not?" <laughs> okay. Well, uh, who's going to pit, guys? Well, Kirk Shelmerdine's going to pit. Yeah, okay. I know that. Say, but, uh, I Nobody would be surprised. else. Yeah, I would be surprised if Purpose comes in. He has enough fuel to go the rest of the way. The car is just working great. So he is not fitting. The pits are open. Boy Allen Jr. Uh, See, they were pretty far back towards the tail end of that because they were not far from being last in the last year. Here comes Kirk Shelmerdine. Yep. Yeah. Boy yeah. Allen Jr. is going to stay out. Shelmerdine is coming in. John Kernan, he's headed toward you. Bob, I tell you, you've never seen a happier bunch of guys in this Mike Connor-led crew of Kirk Shelmerdine's. They heard about the caution, and they went nuts down here. They were slapping each other on the back, crossing their fingers, going, boy, we really needed that. So Kirk pulls in, this time under caution. There's the thumbs up from the gas man. The gas is flowing in. They're only going to put in one can of fuel. Kirk waiting. The fuel's already, uh, fuel fueling has been complete. Now they're checking on the right side, checking the tires. Let's go down to Dr. Jerry Punch, who's with Gary Ballou. And Gary Blue, the crew chief for Jeff Purvis. And Gary, you guys wouldn't, wouldn't even think about coming down pit road. No, uh, the car's driving real good right now. He said it's just a little tight. And we feel that, you know, that loosened the chassis back up. But the car's driving real good. And there's just really no sense in coming in and, and maybe having a problem here in the pit. So we're going to stay out and just try to finish this thing up where we're at. Now, car owner James Finch gave you a message to relay to your driver. What did he say? He said just stand on the gas and get after him. They told him to check out, which is what Jeff Purvis is going to try to do when they drop the green. Well, he has successfully done so in previous restarts, and we'll see if he can when the green comes out this time. We'll take another break and be back with more of the ARCA 200 from Daytona International Speedway. And, uh... <laughs> 
Chocolate Myers. Chocolate. I couldn't think of his first name. How You're can I kidding. forget Chocolate's name? <laughs> <laughs> He's a gas man for the Dale Earnhardt. Dale Earnhardt car <laughs> on the Western Cup. Talking to Kirk Shelmerdine's mechanic. Getting set for a restart, you can see that the scoreboard shows that 63 laps have been completed and the number one car that started in first position is the leader of the race and the number two car that started in second position is second. And we only have four cars on the lead lap. Shelmerdine is third and in fourth position is, is uh, Jeremy Mayfield. I tell you what, Kirk has done a heck of a job today, hasn't he, Ned? He really has. He, he is, has driven as well as, as you could drive. Had that little problem with the gas in the pits, but they came back, got this caution, so they're set to go. Let's see what he can do now on a restart. Well, it is a sad time for the sports world with the news last night of the death of Arthur Ashe, who passed away last night from uh, pneumonia. Our hearts are with Arthur Ashe and his family. And also, we in the auto racing community lost a competitor last week as Connie Saylor died of cancer in Johnson City, Tennessee. Connie was a three-time starter in the Daytona 500, competed in many ARCA races during his career. I took diet pills. I lost 30... International Speedway in the ARCA 200, and we're just about to go green from the third caution period of the afternoon. Here's our AutoZone race recap. This was before the caution flag came out. Jeff Purvis had led 52 of the 61 laps, three caution periods, total of eight laps. Six lead changes among four drivers and an average speed of 145.20 miles an hour. The list of drivers and cars out of the race is a long one, mainly because of a accident on the third lap between turns three and four that eliminated about 20 cars. But there are the drivers that have fallen out of competition. And the lap leaders, Jeff Purvis, Loy Allen Jr., Frank Kimmel, and Kirk Shelmerdine has also led a lap. Here is that big crash that occurred on lap number three. Going in the third corner, the blue car on the inside, Bob Shack. We see he goes up, he touches Tim Fedor. That's the red car. And then the cars, they were, they were racing for third spot. And Ned, nowhere to go? When the front cars, cars up towards the front of the pack, gets in trouble and they start spinning, there is nowhere to go for the others coming in there at full speed and about half of the field involved. But the good news was that no driver injuries were sustained at all. All drivers were able to walk away without any injuries. And so the lights on top of the pace car are out. The field is lined up for the restart, and we should be going back to green here in just a moment. Now, Bobby Bauscher in number 21 is the car lined up right inside of the leader, Jeff Purvis. He is in fifth position. He'll be trying to get the lap back, but if uh, history holds true, Purvis is going to run away. Yes, he's going to be awfully difficult to get the lap back from Jeff Purvis because that Chevrolet Lumina has been awfully fast. Green flag, here they go. Loy Allen Jr. is in second position. Third is Mayfield now. And Kirk Shelmerdine back to fourth position. Those are the only four cars that are on the lead lap. Now, Loy Allen was able to pull up, well, I started to say reasonably close, but look <laughs> at Purvis now, try to stretch it out. And that's what he wanted to do. His father was telling him, get on it. Try to stay in the draft. Pull away from those other two cars that are in the lead lap. And they, at least maybe you can finish second in this race if you can't pass Purvis has a rule that you can't start on the outside line with 25 laps to go. Frank Kimmel, if you're a lap down. Frank Kimmel was a lap down. He lined up on the outside. We understand he's going to be given a black flag for that infraction. Here's uh, Kirk Shelmerdine trying to get by. Now that's Mayfield, Mayfield trying to go by Bobby Bowser. That's Shelmerdine, the other white car. Yep, sneaking up on the back end of uh, Mayfield's car. Now looking toward the outside. There is the black flag for those who uh, lined up on the outside row on the lead lap. Shelmerdine not able to take away third position from Mayfield. He has a pretty good run coming off of turn two. I don't know if he's pretty far back. Now they're all dipped down to the inside. Purvis trying to break the draft from the cars behind him. Hey, guys, this thing's about over. You know, there's only 14 laps to go. Mm -hmm. You got it. That's Shelmerdine fine. looks high this time in the third turn. That's where he has done most of his passing all day long. He's comfortable up there. Ooh, he almost had a run on him coming off the corner. Mm -hmm. 
He probably will try it on the outside down in one. Because you're right, Ned. He seems to be comfortable up high. The car's working well for him up there. Couldn't There's Frank Kimmel, who did make the... Uh, the wrong uh, position on the restart and had to come in for a stop and go penalty. Kimmel now moving again. He was running in uh, sixth, sixth position. Never seen Mayfield is pulled out trying to break the draft on Schumerdeen. Race for third place. Now he has a good run coming off of turn two this time. Let's see if he can build enough momentum or off of turn four, I should say. And look at that. They've gained the, yeah. the second place car. They just about caught Lloyd Allen. The interval is lessening between second and third and fourth, and it's widening between first and second. That's right. <laughs> That's another good point, Ned. Well, how about it? If these three guys would hook up in the draft, might they be able to catch Purvis? He's sure been awful strong, but uh, will the draft have that much of an effect? I don't think they're catching. I don't think you've got the horses to catch him. Yeah, yeah they're hooked up in a draft right now. They're, he's yeah. pulling away from them. Jerry Punch, what do you think out of the, in the uh, pit area? Well, Jeff Purvis seems to be concerned primarily about one car and one car only. He said, Loy Allen Jr. may be the only car on the track with enough horsepower to be able to run with me. But if Loy Allen Jr. uses the draft to bring two more guys with him, we could have a shootout. Well, I don't know. I don't think Purvis has to worry about anybody right now. No. Well, I don't think so, too. And I'll tell you one thing they need to do. They're doing a, a reasonably good job of drafting here, Benny, but they're not doing what they need to do. They've got to run absolutely bumper to bumper. That's when you get the most effect from the drafting. When you're sitting back there, one, two, three car lengths behind the car in front of you, it's not helping that much in the draft. It's helping the cars back behind there, but it's not helping that second place car exactly. that much. They're not helping Loy Allen pick mm -hmm. up speed. No. In fact, it might even be a little bit of a drag on him. I would think that it is hurting Loy Allen's speed around the racetrack. You're right. Mayfield needs to pull up closer to him. But once again, these fellas, the first time that Mayfield's ever been here, I think this is probably yep. the first time that Kirk Schumerding has ever run a Daytona. So it's a learning process. And that backs up exactly what you guys are talking about. One reason that this race is so important is to give drivers that have stock car aspirations some good experience on the super speedways. Ten laps to go. Seventy laps have been completed now with Jeff Purvis still holding on to the lead. Loy Allen Jr. second. Jeremy Mayfield third. And Kirk Shelmer, Dean, is fourth. Right back. We've got a bit of an edge with the... Kirksville, Tennessee leads the ARCA 200 with less than 10 laps to go. It's been a pretty easy race for Jeff. There comes second, third, and fourth. Loy Allen Jr., Jeremy Mayfield, and Kirk Shelmer, Dean. There comes Kirk on the inside trying to take it away. Can't make the pass on Mayfield. Am I seeing things with Loy Allen gaining? I think he is a little bit, but not appreciable. Well, he has pulled away from the other two a little bit, whether that makes it look closer or not, but uh, doesn't appear to be losing much right now. And he's doing it all by himself. Mm -hmm. Not really any help, as Ned pointed out. Meanwhile, those cars are, are locked up pretty good. They're, they're in a pretty good draft. Mm -hmm. If you get that close together, it's more effective. But there again, they fall back in the corner. Mm -hmm. Jerry Punch is with Purvis's car owner, Jerry. Bob, we're with James Finch here. And James, you've got to be awfully pleased with the way the car and driver have both performed here today. I sure have. The car's been real consistent all day. Now, you bought two other cars. This could be the beginning of a pretty good week for you. I hope so. But uh, Larry and uh, Four Car and all those people have really helped us a whole bunch in this effort here. You think he's nervous, guys? He's dancing around back here watching his car lead, hoping to set a hold on. This guy wants to go to victory lane. I don't blame him. I visited there one time. It's an awfully nice place, Bob. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Is it a feeling that you can describe no. in your old age here? <laughs> you know, people ask me what does it feel like. I mean, it really is, folks, a first-hand experience. It's not really something that you can pass on, even to my good friend, Bob. <laughs> and usually a friendly place down there, too. Yeah, it? very yeah. friendly. <laughs> Second, third, and fourth continue to battle it out for position while Jeff Purvis sets the pace. Seven laps to go. Purvis now is pulling away. I'm convinced he is down there, yes. yes you, can, you can see it. He came up from a couple of lap cars, picked up the draft from them, went on around, and he's moving away. Jeff he's... Purvis's best finish in a, an ARCA race, 1992, was third at Talladega, but he's won many all-pro races that we cover every year down in Nashville. 
you know, Purvis has done a beautifully, beautiful job working the traffic today. Now, it really hasn't slowed him down like it has, say, Loy Allen and Kirk and some of these other fellas. He just blows right on by the company. Well, he's used it to his advantage many times. He'll come up and use the draft pick up a little bit of speed but it doesn't get too close to them when he when he comes up on them with a lot of momentum he doesn't run right up on their back bumper before he makes the move he, he pulls out a car length or two away so as to not get himself in any kind of trouble there we see the complete rundown all those cars out involved in that huge crash on lap three still that's a race for second third fourth I'm sure we would have had some good battles in the in the back of the pack had those 20 cars remained in the race that crashed there on the third turn. But I don't think that anybody would have given Jeff Purvis any more competition than they, these three guys are. Well, Boy Allen qualified on the outside pole. this orange and white number two, uh, and he's not been able to do anything with Purvis. So I doubt if anyone back in the pack could do it. Maybe Red Farmer. Yeah, Red had a good race car. Glotz back, of course, was in the race. He's always strong here. And Charles told me he was going to run the entire ARCA circuit this year. Yep, he's going for the championship. <laughs> Rough way to start out, though. Sure is yeah, that race. That's for sure. That crash. There's the interval, and it has widened. Purvis back to Allen, Mayfield, and Shelmerdine with now five laps to go. And meanwhile, we got a pretty good race going here. Lloyd Allen had pulled out to a few car length advantage, but here comes Kirk on the outside trying to make a run. He thought he had the momentum coming off of there, and I did. I thought he had too, Benny, but once they pulled down to that inside a little bit, it seemed to break that momentum for him. Mayfield's trying to figure out, he's the man in the middle. He says, what do I need to do? What am I doing here? What do I need to do to get in front or keep this guy behind me, behind me? Yeah, driving offensively and defensively. 76 laps now completed, four to go. There's a Chevrolet in front. That's a Ford in second place. That's a Chevrolet in third. And uh, is that an Oldsmobile? Oldsmobile. Kirk's driving. Mm -hmm. Kirk's won it once again. He's on the outside. Hunt. He's trying to get that momentum. I think Coming he's got him. Second turn. If he has it built up, he could pass Mayfield down the back stretch. I think he's got him. Yep, he got he does. him. Good move. Kirk Chevrolet has taken over that third spot. Now, I'm sure he's telling Mayfield he's giving the motion hand signal, get in line, and let's run up and try to catch that two car. We're running out of laps, about three laps to go once we get back to the line. Now the two cars trying to break the trap. You see him move down to the inside. I believe with the spoiler as large as it is on these cars, though, that he might be able to, to pick up the draft of Allen. Opening up a pretty good amount of air, a lot of vacuum there. Now less than three laps to go. Jeff Purvis has things well in hand, and Loy Allen Jr. now has quite a bit of separation between himself and Shelmerdine, but Kirk and Jeremy will try to chase him down. It looks like Kirk Shermerdine is running wide open. Yeah, I think he is. When he was behind uh, Mayfield, he was not able to do that. Mm -hmm. But we can see how much faster he is once he got in front. Yeah, he, he has pulled away from him. And now appears to be gaining on Loy Allen. Looks like he is. What is it, two laps to go? Yeah, he's running out of time, though, because there's the one, the uh, 78 lap mark. Next time around, they'll see the white flag. I think he's going to catch it. Yeah, I think he'll catch it. Mm -hmm. Now, whether they'll have enough momentum once he gets to him to move on by well time will tell yes yeah, so i think it's going to depend on where he catches him mm -hmm. if he catches him off a corner he might be able to pass and battling for position two laps down the number 18 car driven by robert ham and Craig rubite in 15 yeah the 15 car craig rubright seventh and eighth they're battling for they may be a couple of laps down to the leader but uh positions are important to each driver white flag is coming out to Jeff Purvis. Here he comes, crossing the strike. One more lap to go. It is still Loy Allen Jr. leading Kirk Shelmerdine. I don't know, guys. I don't think uh, Kirk's going to catch him. I don't think he is either now. Uh, I thought he was going to, but you're right. It doesn't appear as, as he can. Loy doing a great job holding that car right in the groove that he needs to be, if just as, a, as Jeff Purvis is. Well, the former dirt late model champion in 1983, Jeff Purvis, is headed toward his first ARCA victory. He has dominated this race.
probably about as much as I've seen recently. He Kirk is moving closer as they come into turn four, but I don't think he's going to be able to pass him, but he is going to catch him by the time they get to the start finish line or almost catch him. Here comes Purvis off the fourth corner onto the trioval, crossing the stripe. Jeff Purvis wins the ARCA 200. Their second place, Loy Allen. He finishes about two car lengths ahead of Kirk Shelmerdine, and the fourth place goes to Jeremy Mayfield. And there's the celebration in Jeff Purvis's pit. He has won the ARCA 200. Now, here's this paddle for seventh position between Rubright and the uh, 18 car of Robert Ham. Looks like Rubright's going to get it. That's the white car in front. Yep, he did. Sean Kernan is with James Finch. James, you lost your hat, but Gary gave you the radio there for those last few laps. Did you talk at all to Jeff? No, he wasn't saying much. <laughs> he was just letting it go. As Jerry asked you earlier, you've got a pretty good deal here uh, coming with uh, Larry McClure helping you and selling you those cars. A little bit loud down here with all the cars, but uh, going by finishing up the race. But this could be the start of a really big week for you guys. What a way to kick it off. I hope so. We're going to try and um, qualify for the 500 tomorrow or Tuesday. We had a little problem with the car Saturday, uh, during Tech uh, Thursday, I guess. Well, that's James Finch, the car owner for Jeff Purvis. He is headed on his way to Victory Lane. So we'll probably see him in the Goodies 200 next Saturday, and we'll look for him in the Daytona 500. Purvis's car has been stopped just off uh, of the fourth corner on pit road. The second place car of Loy Allen Jr. lining up behind. I would guess that they're going to measure spoiler. the rear spoiler. Yeah, yeah. exactly what they're doing. To make the sure spoiler. that they're 50 degrees what they're supposed to be, because two or three degrees is speed. Just four cars finished on the lead lap, and those four, in addition to the fifth-place car of Bobby Bauscher, have lined up there and will get their spoilers checked before it's ruled official. Purvis has climbed out of the car, though. Congratulated by the ARC official. Phoenix Construction Chevrolet. Young Clarksville, Tennessee driver has won in dramatic style here at Daytona. What's he looking for? Making sure he didn't. He's going to check that right front because he hadn't changed tires. He ran 200 miles on that same set of tires. So there they are checking the spoiler. Loy Allen coming over, congratulating him. Well, uh, ah, it's okay. I think it's official. Yes. <laughs> the uh, congratulations from the ARC official indicating everything's okay with the spoiler. And Jeff Purvis can now be declared the official winner of the ARCA 200. And he can drive this thing down to victory lane and uh, continue on with the picture. He said, we're gonna push the car. Well, that was just the first of uh, two events that we're covering for you on ESPN here at Daytona. Next Saturday night at eight o'clock Eastern time, that's five Pacific time, we'll have same day coverage of the Goodies 300, always one of the best races of all in stock car speed weeks here at Daytona. We will be back with a full field rundown and, of course, our winter interview with Jeff Purvis when we return to Daytona International Speedway. SeaWorld, a great attraction down in the Orlando area. We want to thank uh, Airship Shamu and SeaWorld for providing the overhead shots, as you see right now over Victory Lane. Now, moments ago, remember the car stopped up uh, to get its spoiler checked up toward turn number four. Then the car came into Victory Lane, but it didn't have a driver in it. <laughs> Watches everyone says, hey, wh where's the driver? Wait a minute. Everybody's There's... looking for Jeff Purvis. Where's the driver? <laughs> <laughs> Larry Beluskin, PR director here at the Daytona International Speedway. We found him, Jerry. <laughs> Well, we got we found Jeff Purvis. The car came in a minute ago, but he wasn't in the car. I mean, that's excitement. You jumped out of the car and decided to walk down pit road as you get some of the family here to, to share this victory. Jeff, congratulations on a wonderful win. Thanks. I tell you what, that, the crew did such a good job. The car, it just never faltered all day long. It just it stayed out there, and you just it's just too easy right there. I know you did, you weren't involved, but what did you see in your rearview mirror on lap three when it all broke loose there in, in the third turn? I saw my chances of winning increasing right there rapidly, but uh. I, you know, they were running side by side, and I saw them, you know, just almost banging doors down the straightaway, and I figured we'd better get it straightened out as quick, as, as quick as we could, but 
I never did. I never did know who broke loose first. I never did know what happened. I just I came back around and I saw cars just sitting everywhere, skid marks everywhere. The same crew, James Finch, the car owner, Gary Ballou, the crew chief, the beginning of what could be a big week for you. Well, it really could. We still got a couple more races coming up down here. We still got to qualify for the Winston Cup race. And uh, I, if I could just get the Winston Cup car running like this one right here, I believe we'd be a contender. Jeff Purvis picks up win number one in ARCA competition, winning the ARCA 200. Let's go up to the garage area where a very happy Kirk Shelmer Dean is standing by with John Kernan. Well, Kirk, you know, you get a lot of attention from the media whenever you were working as crew chief for Dale Earnhardt. This has to be a little bit better for you. Here, your driver, a great run today, third. I mean, things are looking up as far as your driving career. Well, I still don't want to call it a career. I think <laughs> we had a real good car today, and we ended up having a good finishing spot. Switch hats here. <laughs> I had a, uh, I had a pretty good break there at the first of the race, and we missed that big mess ahead. But um, I think thank the spotter Craig Darnley for that. He's been with us a long time, and he's neighbor of mine he does a real good job spotting for us and he saved my tail there but that right there passed most of the cars for me i, I just sort of rode around and uh i had my car a little bit too tight there at the end that i'd push off a of two if i didn't do it just right and i said it that way i didn't really know what to expect here at daytona so next time we'll know i guess now a question about the uniform did you borrow this from dale or is this from your old days at richard children's this is my tire changing uniform it's the only one i got <laughs> you gonna be able to buy another one now I don't know what this race paid. I will see. <laughs> Kirk Shelberdine after a fine third place finish. I think we'll see him behind the wheel and running up front later this year. All right. Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, big smile, obviously, from Kirk's face. He's a happy guy after really turning in a good performance here and finishing third. I got to tell you a story. When I first came to, to Daytona 19. 65. Let's go ahead with a okay. recap. I'll tell you a story in a moment, Bob. Jeff uh, led 71 of the 80 laps, three caution periods, total of 12 laps, six lead changes among the four drivers, and the average speed was 143.8. Loy Allen Jr. finished in second, rather, yes, yeah, second position, and we will be back to talk with him when we return to Daytona International Speedway. The ARCA 200 has been won by Jeff Purvis. You know, working at AutoZone. Down here in Daytona for Winston Cup practice coming up following the collusion of the ARCA 200. And we urge you to stick around on ESPN at 8 o'clock tonight. It's the Pro Bowl from Honolulu. Here's John Kernan. Loy, a fine run for you today. Second place finish. You told me earlier today you wanted to hook up with Red Farmer and go back to drafting school, if you will. But that wreck took him out. But you still were able to learn a few things today. Oh, I was. I got a lot of experience uh, with other cars around the racetrack. Uh, it was a pretty good day. Uh, the Hooter Jasper Power Ford ran really well all day. Uh, the Chevrolet with Purvis, he was pretty strong. Uh, but still, we got a lot of experience today. What about Purvis? I mean, uh, was there anything that you could could have for him at the end were you guys trying to hook up there in a the three-car draft could you have been able to have uh, like hunt him down maybe past him it would have been really hard uh we took a little bit of bite out of the car and the car picked up a little bit so i think purvis slowed down with about two laps to go uh it, it would have it would have been tight there at the end but uh, i think purvis he was pretty fast today that's Lloyd allen jr a fine second place finish for today let's go down pit road to dr jerry punch who's caught up with red farmer well, a man who won his first race back in 1949, some 44 years ago, Red Farmer, what a way to end it up early here with just a few laps of racing. Well, it sure was, because especially because we know we had such a real good car. We finally found our problem after qualifying yesterday. We not ran some practice laps right at 190 miles an hour, so we knew we had something for him today. I was just sitting there riding, taking it easy, waiting for the field to get strung out so I could make my move, and we were just sitting there bumper to bumper like a pace lap, and when the chain reaction crash started right in front of us, there was nowhere to go, and it took out you know 20 cars and probably 15 of the best cars so it uh when you take out the front of the field like that it really you know kills the racing would you reconsider possibly run one more one more super speedway events that you didn't really get to finish today well i don't know you know i would like to but uh i, I really wanted to go out uh, winning my last race on the super speedway but i pretty well promised everybody that it would be my last one so i'll probably i'm gonna try to stick to it and uh just stay with running my short tracks on the dirt cars and the half miles and stuff and then work for Davey on the bush cars. Now, wait a minute. We go back to Talladega here in a couple of months. That's the home state, the home crowd. Davey can get this car fixed, and that brings a smile, maybe. Well, you know, I would probably like to do that. I like Tal Talladega and Daytona is the only really big tracks I like to race on uh, anymore. And uh, naturally, I like to win Talladega again, too. 
I won it twice. I like to win it three times, but uh, you know that's uh, down the road right now. Of course, if you retire, you're always allowed to come out of retirement a couple times, right? Now wait a minute. What's this on your hat? Is that, is that a uh, you getting ready to, to go fishing here? You got a fish hook? You're you're ready to go over to the lake? No, in the morning, like I say, you know, one day you're hero, the next day you're zero. Tomorrow I go back to zero. We unload the bush car in the morning at six o'clock. Start getting Davy ready for the 300 next week. So next week I'm I'm starting to be a crew chief in the morning. A crew chief in the morning. What a way for a legend to say goodbye. 60-year-old Red Farmer, over 700 career victories. He calls it quits here after a short afternoon. Bob? Red Farmer competed here at Daytona in 1959. He drove a 37 Ford Coupe in the modified Sportsman 200 and finished 23rd in a field of 52. Now the crash that uh, you uh, may have missed. It happened on the third lap of the event. There's the blue car. Goes up, that's Bob Shack makes contact with the red car, 10 feet away. These cars started third and fourth. That's where they were running and just totally blocked the racetrack. Man, oh man. Nowhere to go. Smoke, the racetrack completely blocked. And the, what, 22 cars did we finally figure out maybe piled into that? About half of the field was involved in that accident and most of them were taken out totally. But again, no injuries to any drivers, and so uh, that's the best news. Now, Benny, this little boy here wearing the white T-shirt, <laughs> I have a feeling there's some significance to that T-shirt. Well, we talked about Kirk Shermerdine's uniform, and that was his pit crew changing uniform that he wore to drive a race car. In 1965, when I came here, that was my uniform, a white T-shirt and a pair of pants, <laughs> and they said, you can't drive there. You got to have flame-proof clothing. So, so watch me. I don't have a uniform, so I had to go buy a pair of eight eight dollar coveralls <laughs> and douse them with this chemical and made them render them flame proof. Boy, so and eight bucks for a uniform. <laughs> and you, like Kirk Shelmerdine, finished third in I, race. I, I finished third race. in car number ninety eight. How about that? Amazing. So a lot of parallels. Similarities. Yes. <laughs> Well, the ARCA schedule as far as ESPN is concerned at Talladega, at Pocono, and the final race of 93 at Atlanta. Back with more from Daytona in a moment. Camus with the overhead shot of Victory Lane here at Daytona as Jeff Purvis is having his picture taken. He is the winner of today's ARCA 200. On the racetrack, meanwhile, the Winston Cup cars are qualifying, second, or practicing rather, second round qualifying will be tomorrow here at the two and a half mile trioval. That's Yesterday, Bobby Labonte in the Maxwell House for Thunderbird. Yesterday, we determined the front row for the Daytona 500. Kyle Petty will be the pole sitter at 189.426, and Dale Jarrett on the outside of the front row, 189.274. The defending champion of the ARCA series finished in fifth position, Bobby Bowsher. Here's Jerry. Now, it may not seem like much of an accomplishment if you didn't see the beginning of the race, folks, but this guy did one heck of a job. How'd you miss that mess in lap three over there? I don't know. I tell you, you know, I kind of backed up from the start a little bit, and I knew the sun was going to have just a matter of time. And when I seen the smoke start flying and the parts going everywhere, I just, you know, decided which way I was going to go and went on from there. But I just went down off the banking and tried to get a hole to go through and couldn't really see much of anything, but we just come through it all right. Two seconds in a row, now a fifth in the same race car. Got to feel like maybe you got that same lucky rabbit's foot for this season? <laughs> well, he's carrying the lucky uh, lucky rat today, but it wasn't too lucky to us. But, uh, you know, yeah, well, it's a good start to the season. Can't be, you know, too too hard on ourselves about not running better. But we got a good start to the season. Get this quality farm Fleet Ford Thunderbird up front in the points, you know, going to Pensacola and try to defend the title. Now, what do you want to do? I know you enjoy ARCA racing. That's where Dad raced, won three championships. You won your first one. What's the ultimate goal? Winston Cup, no doubt. You know, we're, we're trying to work towards that, and, you know, a lot of sacrifice goes into this, this deal, and that's what I've been working for is at Winston Cup. And, you know, as long as we keep digging and going the way we're going, I think we're going to make it. This young man has a very good chance of making that dream come true. Let's go up to John Kernan, who's standing by with Frank Kimmel. John? Well, Jerry, you know, earlier we said that Bobby had missed it by closing his eyes. Frank also missed that big wreck. Now, Frank, do you really close your eyes, or do you have to watch? Well, I squinted a little bit, yeah. But <laughs> there was a lot of smoke. You couldn't really see where you were going. I was just very fortunate and lucky that I uh, was able to get through it. Now, this is only your second time ever racing here at Daytona, and you post a sixth-place finish. I mean, you learned a lot during that rookie season. Yeah, we really had a good season. Uh, the car ran good all year for us. We didn't have very many problems at all on the speedways. So uh, it was a good run for us. We got to run close to the front occasionally, and it was, uh, it was a good experience. Now you won the Rookie of the Year title last year. This year, full schedule. Do you think you can make a bid for the championship, win some races? We're hoping to. If we can get up there, we ran fifth this past year, and uh, we've got our sponsors back, and, and we're hoping that uh, 
we can improve on what we did last year, maybe win a few races. What about the future plans, uh, different forms of racing? Well, it's uh, everybody like to get out there and practice right now with these guys, and that's what we'd like to do. And uh, it just takes a little more time, a lot more experience. So we'll just keep struggling along with what we're doing. That's the defending rookie of the year, Frank Kimmel, with a fine sixth place finish today. And Frank Kimmel, as he indicated, would like to be out there with these Winston Cup cars practicing and uh, trying to find some more speed. ESPN is the place to be for NASCAR Winston Cup racing in 1993. 15 big races are on the schedule beginning March 28 with the Trans South 500 at Darlington, South Carolina. Then Bristol, North Wilkesboro, Martinsville, the short track season, the first half of it. After Martinsville, we'll move to the Super Speedway at Talladega, then to the road course, then to the Super Speedway at Pocono. The first half of the season will be completed right here at Daytona with the Pepsi 400. Then ESPN cameras move back to the road course at Watkins Glen, the two-mile high bank tri-oval at Michigan International, the short track at Bristol, then Darlington once again, and we're not finished yet. The Good East 500 from Martinsville comes in September, then North Wilkesboro when we'll wrap it up at Atlanta, Georgia. Full field rundown of this ARCA race when we come back in just a moment. Well, there was an exciting moment on the third lap of the ARCA race this afternoon when a uh, multi-car chain reaction crash broke out. This is how it looked from the pedigree in-car camera carried by Jim Sauter. You can see that Mike Wallace turns right in front of him sideways and here comes a car, boom. They meet head on and he goes down and, and runs in the side of Mike Wallace, I believe, but in the smoke, that's about what the visibility looks for a race car driver when he goes in the corner like that. It's getting knocked around like a pinball. Uh, Jim Sauter was able to come back and uh, complete a few laps. Now here is a complete field rundown. Jeff Purvis, of course, the winner with Loy Allen Jr. second, Kirk Shelmerdy.